Are MMO players just bad gamers who rely on vertical progression to compensate? Yes, I know that because I'm one of them. You're trying to get me in trouble and I'm, I'm going to jump right in. If you had a day to walk around Intrepid Studios during the normal work hours, ask them questions, sit in on meetings, whatever, what would you do? I would find an empty station and try to log on and play. How do you bring something from pen and paper to like a 3D model? I got to walk around the studio, meet everybody, go to Belgium. And then they also brought me back for the official release, which is when they have like the big press brief. I'm going to need a tier list from you of Ashes creators. I wouldn't say we are bad gamers. I would say that we are... Are MMO players just bad gamers who rely on vertical progression to compensate? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, oh my God, dude. Again, I can I can throw this right back to World of Warcraft, right? We have the world first race. Every single time yeah. a new raid drops, you have the yep. world first race. The best raiders in the world compete to, to kill this raid before anybody else. And you think about like the last the last skill to do, I think it was um um limit, right? Or or liquid, one of those two. They beat the final boss of the last raid. The second week the raid was out, it took them 460-something pulls to kill that boss. Um, 467 pulls. The best, the best, literal best raid team in the entire world. And then everybody comes after them. And, and people are like, oh, I'm a cutting-edge raider. I'm like, okay, when did you get your achievement? They're like four months into the, into the tier. They're like, you got, that just means you had to increase your gear level to the maximum it could possibly be before you were able to kill that boss. And that, that tells you everything you need to know. You had to wait until you were full geared. And then the guys who did it day one were like 10, 15 item levels under the raid content because they're right. what they didn't have time to gear out. So I, I think it absolutely is. There's, there's the fake it till you make it mentality and gear will definitely make up for skill in a lot of like, you can, you can go from dodging to mechanics to just soaking mechanics because your gear will keep you alive. I mean, I'm sure some of them are, <laughs> but I think, um, I think a lot of people who enjoy MMOs are people who just like that, that socialness. I know for myself, I really like playing a game that actually feels alive. Like, of course I enjoy single player games as well, but, um, it makes it that much more exciting to I don't know, go be on your way to town and especially seeing like that status of where you could get to by seeing someone like mounted on like a cool dragon or they're wearing cool armor or something along those lines and kind of being like, oh, my gosh, like I want that. You know, <laughs> you get a, a little case of the gimmies and it makes you kind of motivated to pursue something in the game that you didn't even know was in there. And you don't really get that with a lot of uh, like single player games, mostly or um you know that kind of thing so that's something i really enjoy with mmos is when you get stuff and achievements and stuff and you kind of get to show it off and it feels like you kind of get to um what's the word i'm looking for not necessarily flaunt it but like motivate other people sure. to do something that they didn't think that that was even possible in the game and that kind of stuff and of course school when people are like hey nice mount like that kind of stuff are mmo players just bad gamers who rely on vertical progression to compensate yes i know that because i'm one of them no <laughs> <laughs> no i like i think some mmo gamers are that right but they're not not every mmo gamer is that not right not every tab target enjoyer is that and it goes back to what we we're talking about how people like a billion dis different systems so that they can express themselves in a way that will give them an advantage and it's more of a strategic tactical kind mm. of thing rather than your you know uh, keyboard presses per minute or whatever the hell uh, the phrase is yeah um, apm yeah apm there's uh, there's some people who obviously aren't very skilled who like mmos right that's completely fine and maybe they want to uh, out gear their opponents by just playing more right that is a thing um, but I don't think that's every MMO gamer. I'm not really that gamer. I sort of joked at the start that I was that kind of guy. But one of the reasons I like New World, and I know New World is a very controversial subject, and I'm sorry for even mentioning it. Some people are going to want to spit on me. But um, one of the things I like New World is that I was like a pretty average PvPer. All of the comments are going to be like, no, you weren't, Jay. You were rubbish. But I was a pretty average <laughs> PvPer. And um, there was a guy who I would occasionally fight who could literally kill me whilst he was naked. And I was fully geared up and I was like, 
this just shows there's a massive skill discrepancy here. And I like that, right? I liked the skill being an issue. And I actually like MMOs, personally, where the skill and the gearing matters. Like, MMOs have a bit of a problem. Who do you reward? Do you reward people who play the game a lot? Do you reward the people who are very skilled? And a lot of MMO gamers probably want to be rewarded for playing a lot. And they'll say, well, you know, we're putting in the effort, so we should be rewarded. And that's hard to deny, right? Because that's that's one of the things you like about MMOs. You put in your effort, you get your reward, you get stronger. But yeah. this goes back to one of the things that we we're talking about with the arena in Throne of Liberty. Some, some gameplay, you can reward skill more than the time invested. And I think something like an equalized gear arena can be a perfect example where the skill action and is I mean, not actual action combat, but the people who really want to, you know, show off their skills, that's where they should do it. And then the people who want to grind and play the game a lot and just beat people because they know all the intricate systems and all this kind of stuff, that's the rest of the game. So I remember all gamers like that, probably, but that's because, you know, they can't play Fortnite because they get the bums handed to them. And that makes sense. So, <laughs> you know, I think and I think Ashes of Creation specifically, hopefully it can appease everybody in that sense. Sure. Uh, for the record, I do play Fortnite and I play MMOs, but I play Fortnite with my son. Yikes. Okay. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. <laughs> I love this question. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say we are bad gamers. I would say that we are... A different breed of gamer. <laughs> a much wiser. Much, so, yes. much, so much yeah, more we, deliberate and thoughtful. We, we appreciate time and investment. You know, <laughs> it's not, we're not rushing through for this one Fortnite match before we go to bed. We're like, we're sitting down for the next three years of our life and being like, this is exactly what I'm going to do in this game going forward. And I think it takes a special type of mentality to, you know, put that much time into a game because... Games are meant to end, whereas MMOs really don't ever end. You're trying to get me in trouble, and I'm I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to say yes, <laughs> absolutely. I, I think I, I've had this discussion on my channel quite a bit about vertical progression. There, the, Every single game has had level caps increased, 700, 800. There was a point in time where uh, ESO was uncapped. So you... Yeah, so Cyrodiil, right? Their assist, yeah. So you had cha you have champion, champion points, points, you could get a total... You, have, you get a total of 3,600, and when the game first started, you didn't have a cap. You could go all the way up to 3,600, and um, there were some players you faced where like they were like four or five times as strong as you because they had PC accounts, and they were playing two years before you, and like there's literally nothing you could do. And so what ESO did is they said, hey, we're going to put a champion point cap, and we'll slowly increase over time. So instead of having these super powerful accounts that grinded for hours and days and whatever, we're going to put these caps on and you know we're going to start with 500. So you had people that had 800 champion points after a year that were like, you, you just took away a third of my power. You took away a third of what I'm trying to do. This is BS, yada, yada, yada. And that was the, that was the big complaint when it first came out. And you know my argument was always like, dude, you've been playing for two years. If, if the champion point cap, cap is what's making you a better player and it's not your skill of having played for two years and knowing your class for two years over everybody else that hasn't this is this is literally a learn to play issue like this is literally the issue that you have and so they slowly increase the cap over time from 500 to 600 700 and 800 and you always had these exact same issues where people are like well this is champion points champion points They're like they should uncap it again and it's like maybe you should just learn to play your class better. <laughs> and yeah, so, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. And so my, my, that's been my take. There's going to be so many different augments. Uh, there's so many different classes. There's so many different ways to specialize your character. And then your hours played in the game should impact your ability to play your class. And if you're relying on vertical progression to do so, you got to get good. Is our, Hey, I was going to ask you, uh, since you brought up, ESO and console because you and Nice both picked up ESO on the console release, right? Yes. Yep. Do you think Ashes is missing an opportunity by not releasing on console? Um man. So ESO didn't initially release on console. Right. Neither did New World. They they did their release. Uh I would say no. I would say it brings in more issues currently that like 
ESO had a lot of issues with bug fixes. Like sometimes they would, yeah. you come out with a new patch update and you have bug issues. And so PC you can fix in the first week or two. In order to do the same thing with Microsoft, you need to pay in and you know need to become affiliated with them. And a lot of games like ESO didn't want that affiliation. And so their patch delay fixes sometimes would take a month or two oh, months. Oh, yeah. Whereas PC... Yeah, and so there would just be something broken that would exist for, for an infinite amount of time that they couldn't go in and fix. And PlayStation would have the exact same thing. They would have months of issues. And it just it creates a lot of... Obviously, you're, you're increasing your player pool. And uh, the, the developers for ESO said that their overall population doubled when they went wow. to console. And, and I think that's great. I think obviously more people is good. But I would, I would probably contest that their work towards bug fixes and patch fixes and stuff like that probably tripled just due to having three different platforms to try to cater to you know if it doubled eso then then you know maybe amazon will pick up another four thousand players when when they <laughs> yeah. launch on console yeah they're gonna go from four thousand to eight thousand so. yeah right i mean it's just gonna yeah. be popping I, i'm gonna say no to that because i think um i i think i would guess the one of the main appeals to an mmo is the living thriving world and that's what people want to be a part of that was one of the biggest reasons why i did it and it's one of the biggest reasons why my friends played mmos back in the day and i don't think that that equates to players that are bad i don't think it really has anything to do with that so i think the majority of the mmo player base is going to be a mix between bad players who are looking for that compensation and, and players that could potentially be really skilled players in, in, in mmos and also video other video games so i don't think it really I don't, I, I, I'm going to go no for that one. So Vladis reacted to every bespoke episode this season. I called it season 3.5. So here's, as Vladis says, a very special guest. I think MMO players have become lazy to just be told what to do. So again, guides, right? So people don't want to really think for themselves they rely on someone else's thought process or someone else's experience to dictate how they should play the game. That to me is, I think, very apparent in today's landscape of gaming in general. Um, would I say that they rely heavily on vertical progression? I don't think so, personally. I, I don't think people rely, like, I don't think, oh, I'm a bad gamer. I rely on vertical progression to just be in the game. I think people rely so much on um, being told like what to do. Uh, one of the reasons why why my guild was successful in New World is because we never stopped recruiting, despite because the player population constantly crumbling. Right. Oh yeah. Guilds left and right were just dying, just uh, you know withering on the vine. But we kept recruiting and we got good at it too. So we would find people who were under geared and but but still performing. And, and trying to parse out the difference between those, there there are some subtleties, and luckily figured figured them out. But we would find people in uh, dungeons, OPR arenas, and be like, "Hey, I noticed you did this mechanic properly, even though you're not geared up. Let's <laughs> let's graduate to the next level. Let's try something else out." And it, it, we we saw a lot of success by doing that. But dude, so many MMO players are just, "Oh no, I put in the work. Oh, now now I don't need to know the mechanics. I don't need to know my class. I don't need to know your class." It's like, mm. it happens. It Evolve happens. or die, buddy, and yep, you're going to die. It happens so much. I like to during any any raid fight, you know, as being the main tank, I'm afforded the opportunity to stand and shit. Because yeah. I'm a tank. Like, you're yeah. not going to kill me, right? So, and I always loved being a tank, um, watching mechanics go off. Because you could just look at the health bars of your party, look at your raid frames, and you knew who was good and who wasn't. Yeah. By <laughs> the, second that, the second that ability goes off, you can see who gets hit. And you're like, mm. and then then maybe you wipe. And then the next time that ability goes off, that same guy gets hit. And then the third time yeah. that ability goes off, that same guy gets hit. You now have a clear target of who's holding back your raid. And it's, it's uh, you don't need damage meters all the time to try to figure that out. If you had a day to walk around Intrepid Studios during their normal work hours, what would you do? Well, first I would get a updated HD screenshot of Steven's office for my background. <laughs> Perfect, good. And gather as much information as I can, even though it'd probably be under NDA if I did a tour. But I, for myself, I'd want to sure. know. I'd like, okay, I want to see this redwood forest that you guys said you were working on in 2022. You know, does that exist? I'm gonna go head over to those guys and see what they're doing. Yeah. 
but I, I, that's pretty much, I think it'd be information on what, like what, what in particular, like, cause you, you're going to have to split your time. You know, there's the mm. combat team. There's, there's all the design teams. There's the engineering, there's the sound. It's true. I, I mean, you know, I just, engineering ain't going to show me nothing. So <laughs> I, I would go to the world building and the environment team and see what they're working on and see everything outside the Riverlands that I possibly could. I would love to sit in on all the combat meetings like that. That's what I want to sit in on. I want, I want to see the combat design for the rogue, uh, which, you know, sadly isn't being shown yet. I, I want to see exactly their interactions for, uh, sorry, siege war or siege wars. Sorry. Guild wars. Uh, I, I just want to see how all these systems are working and, and how they're slowly incorporating things because we've only seen, this is something I keep bringing up as well is, is, like everybody looks at the game and some people are looking at the combat and they're like, oh yeah, you know, the combat doesn't look too good. The combat doesn't look good. And it's like, guys, we're halfway through. Like we have five archetypes shown of the eight. So we're a little over halfway of the archetypes. We haven't even gone into the augments of the classes of the 64 classes. We haven't even really broached the subject of what these augments are going to do. We haven't shown, they haven't shown all the weapons yet, and we haven't seen right. these interactions with how the different combat is going to work. And so the, we, we have like 25%, this is, this is a fake number that I just made up, but we have such a small fraction of the overall combat puzzle that's been shown to us, and there's so much more left to be revealed, and that like I said earlier, I think combat is very important for the game. And so seeing exactly the route they're going is something that I would want to see. Go hang out with Trad and be like, hey. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I, I see you love the fighter. Did you notice in the Node War live stream that he was playing fighter? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's what he plays traditionally in in games uh, per per one of the older live streams. And so you man, he was going in, dude. It was so funny watching him. He jumps into a pile of like ten guys and just starts. He he does his AOE attacks, does the yells, and it was cool to see. And then there was that one time where it took them a while for the tab target people to target him. And so he yeah. was doing some pretty serious damage in there, and then he jumped away, and then someone, a tank, put a wall up, and so he was line of sighted and protected there. Yeah. Dude, yeah, I can't wait stuff. for that. Yeah, I, I'm so looking forward to those interactions. Like, it, it's funny, because when the wall, when, when they showed the wall uh, on the live stream, that's not something that they had happened before. And so right. a lot of people were talking about the tank, and they're like, you know, the tank is lackluster compared to some of the other archetypes that have been shown. And it's like, yeah, well, it came out last year, over yeah. a year ago now, and they've had all this development on all these other classes, and they're they're working on these in, in parallel. And so, yeah, of course, like, they're, they're going to advance and involve this, but because people haven't seen it, they didn't realize that the tank is kind of badass now. Yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of awesome. And so it's like, okay, I want to... I like what you did for tank and I like what you did for, for mage do that for rogue. Now do that for bard. Now do that for summoner. Like let, let's see them all. Do you think so? I mean, there's, there's the Holy Trinity DPS healer tank. Do you think they're making a Holy Courtenary where there's support class is essential to based on how, you know, like the, the bard and, other classes look like they're going to be pretty vital support roles. That's a good question. Um, I'll I'll say it this way. We, we talked a little bit about the Bard this last week. I hope it's not. I, I hope Bard isn't strictly support in the same way that I hope Tank isn't strictly a tank in the same way that I hope Cleric isn't strictly a healer. Like they want to have, you know, the battle mage style build. If you build into right. it, if you build into damage, you shouldn't be able to have like really awesome healing. If you build yeah. into like if you choose a fighter back, like a fighter uh, augment on a tank, you should have more damage than a normal tank. You should be able to input some stuff. You'll, you'll be tankier in nature, but you won't be as tanky as as a tank, like a tank tank archetype is, for instance. And so when I look at a bard, I love the fact that they're going to provide support. I love the fact that they where they're they're like a moving chess piece that can amplify people on the battlefield, but I want them to still be able to it, it does, they don't have to have the damage of a rogue or a fighter, but I want them to be able to participate instead of just being like, you know, the buff bitch in in the game where they're like, "Oh yeah, we're providing all the buffs and I'm I'm playing the flute and Sit I'm there, casting shut this up, and I'm survive and give me more mana." Yeah, like yeah. it just it's it just seems like a such a boring system where players won't play it. But 
if you give me a class that can uh, like if I'm on if I can play a bard where I'm on the front line fighting with fighters and I'm inspiring them to do more damage and I do like you know random number like 70% of the damage that they can do sure. yeah sure my output isn't as great but my ability to amplify people around me is so good that I am valuable and so I'm still participating I'm still fighting I'm still killing I'm still I'm still impacting but then I'm amplifying as well and I think that's a way more interesting mechanic to where yes i'm still technically part of the 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 tri the triad i'm still dcs sure. but I'm, I'm providing like more class specific mechanics that that a bard provides i would find an empty station and try to log on and play <laughs> that's that game game development is wasted on me i'm not i'm not a game developer i'm not going to pretend to know the ins and outs and the intricacies of game development um, we already know everything that we need to know from just our developer live stream. So I'm not really curious about anything. Um, I just want to play like I, I, you know, talking to a developer for me. Other than just, you know, two gamers chit chatting while we play a game is, is different. But like, you know, all these guys like to interview the game developers and Steven have all these development related questions. And I just don't care. Like make the game, take my feedback, make the game. Let me play it. That's all I really care about. Game development on me, it's wasted. Wasted time. <laughs> you guys do what you do. You're the experts. You got the degrees. You know what the hell you're doing. I'm just going to wait for you to pump it out, and I'm going to play the shit out of it. If you had a day to walk around Intrepid Studios during the normal work hours, ask him questions, sit in on meetings, whatever, what would you do? I would find Steven, and I'd give him a kiss on the cheek. <laughs> okay, maybe that's not true. And I'd ask him first, you know, you need consent. It's very important. Um, but um, no, I don't know what I would do with Intrepid. I'm, I'm not, I almost don't want to spoil it for me at the rate mm. sooner than anybody else. So I wouldn't want insider information. If I was going to speak to them, I'd, I'd speak probably directly to Stephen. And I'd just ask him a couple of questions because, you know, I know he's maybe not making every single decision, but he's making the right. important decisions. And I'd ask about the death penalties, right? I'd be like, you know, I don't think these are a good idea. Why do you think they're a good idea? Will you ever change these? You know, I'd ask about the tank name. There's a couple of like key things that I'd be like, hey, <laughs> tell me more about this. And I know he mentions it on stream, but you'd want to know, you know, the non online answer. You'd want to know the actual sort of truth behind it. So I don't know. I wouldn't really do anything crazy. Obviously, you know, for the Internet, I might just try and take some sneak pictures of some biomes and send them to other content creators and be like, ha ha, look, they exist. But um, I don't think I'd do anything crazy. <laughs> I definitely think the first thing I'd want to do is go and check out like what the artists are working on. <laughs> Cause that's like my, my thing. I'm also an artist and love drawing and stuff. So I'd love to go, you know, see, see where they work and their workstations and the kind of um, like tablets and things like that, that they're using in software. Um, and see some of their designs that they're working on and how they just how they do all of it. Like, how do you bring something from pen and paper to like a 3D model? Like, I'm just really um, interested in that kind of process. Um, I obviously would like to get some leaks while I'm there. So I think I'd go around and kind of ask questions to anyone who wants to talk to me. <laughs> um, and. I'd like to say I'd want to sit in on some meetings, but I'd probably glaze over and most of the information would go right over my head. So I would go to the snack room and not just for their snacks, but because I have actually been to Larian Studios before a couple of times and I hung out in their snack room and it's where all the devs actually come in for their breaks in a good mood and you meet so many people and everybody's in a good mood. So there you go. And hopefully they have good food for me too. But I would go right to the snack room. I'd chill in there. And as people came in, talk to them and see how their day's going versus, you know, sitting over their shoulders and watching their every move. What was that like going to, so you've gone to Laren Studios more than once. Yes, I went for, uh, they invited me over for the panel from Hell 5, which is like, you know, kind of like part of the early access period. Um, one of the big updates patches that they had, they did, did a show for it. The one and only Wolfheart who is going to step in as our Barbarian of the day. Uh, he is going to join <laughs> us. He's going to help present the Barbarian. Wolfheart, uh, welcome. And they invited me over there for that one, which was pretty cool because I was the only content creator. Um, and I got to walk around the studio, meet everybody, go to Belgium. And then they also brought me back for the official release, which is when they had like the big press briefing. So you had like all the major news outlets there and like maybe 20 other content creators as well. And 
when you were there, I mean, they, they had you walk around. What were you, what were you doing? Like, so you go to the snack room, you're talking to the devs. What, what kind of conversations do you have in a situation like that? I mean, pretty much every dev that came in, if they looked like they were, I mean, pretty much everybody was friendly there. Uh, so almost everybody, except maybe like one or two, I instantly just asked who they are, what they do. And uh, they were really excited to talk about what they do at Larian Studios. The reason why I was in the snack room was because we were waiting for certain productions to um, to be set up because Larian Studios sets up big shows. So I would just go sit in the in the room because otherwise, I mean, really, what else what else am I going to do? I could I could walk around uh, Ghent, the city of Ghent, which I did do, but I was in there mostly because uh, that was the place where I felt comfortable without like you know getting in the way of everybody doing their things. What kind of questions? I mean, because I would be afraid of, you know, asking a question that would put them in an awkward spot. And they're like, oh, I can't answer that question. Right. So what what kind of things about the game could you and would you ask? So I didn't really ask much about the game. Um, I just tried to treat the experience as just um, relationship building and just hanging out. I didn't want to be um, not that it's wrong to do this, but I didn't want to go over there and shove the GoPro in everybody's faces, et cetera. I just wanted yeah. to go over, experience the studio, um, you know, let them show me what they wanted to show me and not just be the guy that's just trying to get as much information out of them as I can. They were really cool. Um, I don't even remember if I signed an NDA or not. I think I actually did sign an NDA when I walked in, but then okay. um, somebody else in the company, oh my God, am I even allowed to talk about this? Uh, somebody <laughs> else in the company was like, why'd you sign an NDA? We don't, we don't really do that really like with creators. So they're, they're super chill about everything. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to really push, you know, push my buttons with stuff like that that's cool so for the release when when they invited you to belgium for that was it like right before the release was it right after or were you there release day and you know at, they, they hit the go live button and and you were there i don't remember the exact timing but it was definitely maybe man i'd have to think about the time frame but it was definitely at least weeks before the official release maybe even a month I'd have to look back on, on the time frame, but basically they just brought in all the major press outlets um, and, and some YouTubers and Twitch streamers and stuff, and they showed us the whole game, and we did have an opportunity at that one to ask you know, the owner a bunch of questions about the game, et cetera, and they would answer what they wanted to answer. Surprise question. You know, every season has a surprise question. Surprise uh, question. The surprise question this season is I'm going to need a tier list from you of Ashes creators. And I need you to start with like, with like D tier first. And then, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's ruffle some feathers. I'm right. <laughs> well, that wraps up season three of Bespoke. I appreciate you watching. I want to thank this season's Bespeakers. The links to their channels are in the description below. I have plans for future seasons of Bespoke, but that'll be once we're well into testing. If there's something in specific you'd like to see from Bespoke in the future, let me know. Peace.